Great. So thanks so much, everybody, and welcome to the McKnight Foundation. I'm Kate Wolford. I have the privilege of serving as the president of the foundation, and I'm delighted to welcome all of you here to the McKnight office home and really look forward to a fabulous conversation tonight. Thanks also for taking your kind of assigned table seats. We've consciously kind of mixed everybody up so you get to meet some new folks and be able to have the kind of conversation that we want, which is really bringing together trustees and staff from a number of foundations working here in the state so that we can really build deeper relationships and also dig into some of the issues and opportunities that we see before us. McKnight's really pleased to co-host this event with the Blandin and the St. Paul and Minnesota Community Foundations. So let me do the housekeeping and then we'll get into the program. One, um, there will be continued availability of some food over on that table and drinks. If at any point you feel motivated, you're allowed to just get up and go. We're not going to have a formal break again until uh, later in the evening. So just go ahead and, and take care of your needs. Um, also, if you need the restroom along the way, that's kind of they're right at the door as you came in. Um, the other logistical thing I would mention is that we will be videoing Roger Moe's presentation nothing else during the, the conversations, but we do want to capture that and he has agreed that we can do that so that we have a record of his introductory comments. So, we're, just to help us get the room warmed up, and this is always a little dangerous because I'm going to have to interrupt you right as you get going, but we're going to ask you to each turn to one person next to you at your table and each of you gets one minute to just introduce yourself and say kind of why you're here, what brought you here, and maybe what you hope to get out of the evening. But again, you'll only have one minute, and I'm going to be a strict timekeeper. So, all right. As we predicted, there would be no trouble getting conversation going within this room. So hopefully that just gives you a sense of how the evening will unfold. There will be additional opportunities to engage with folks at your table, but hopefully at least now you've made a new friend uh, and learned a little bit about them during this minute plus that I gave you. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Kathleen Annette, who is the president and CEO of the Blandon Foundation. Um, if you don't know Kathy, you should. She's an amazing woman and leader. She grew up on the Red Lake Indian Reservation and is enrolled with White Earth Band of Ojibwe. She's a graduate of the University of Minnesota. She is the first woman in her tribe to become a physician. Before joining the Blandon staff, she held leadership positions for over two decades with the Indian Health Service and has like way too many honors and awards to mention, and I know it would embarrass her if I did, um, but she is uh, well respected for all her accomplishments, and rightly so. Kathy serves on the boards of both the Bush Foundation and the Minnesota Council of Foundations. And with that, I'm delighted to ask you to welcome Kathy Annette. Thank you, Kate. We're, I'm so happy to be here tonight in this beautiful space. This is just wonderful. I feel so lucky to be here with so many different colleagues that I've met now over a number of years, and I'm also so honored to be looking at our work in philanthropy, as I'm sure each and every one of you are too. Minnesota's vitality depends on a shared understanding that rural and urban Minnesota and Minnesota are interdependent. We all do better when we all do better. So what is the role of philanthropy and what could our resources accomplish if we work together better to serve the entire region, the entire state? While we recognize the enormous challenges, we also see enormous opportunity. And we feel now the urgency to do something. We are committed to this inquiry, but we don't know where it will lead. We believe change follows relationship lines. And so we are beginning this way with fellowship and conversation. We hope that after tonight, we'll all feel a bit more connected to one another and more curious about the role and responsibility of philanthropy in addressing rural urban equity. 
Before introducing Lori Sturdivant, who will lead us through much of the evening, I'd like to say a few words about both her and Roger Moe. Both have contributed so much border to border to our quality of life in this state. It's hard to think of two people who know more about the whole state or who have worked harder, longer, and more effectively to create a one Minnesota, a one Minnesota mindset and to implement policies and to maintain a state that works for everyone for every region. And both will tell you that their deep rural roots are important to their achievements. Roger, who as a child lived in a farmhouse without electricity, arguably exerted more sustained influence on our state's public policy than anyone else from the early 70s through the early 2000s. And his imprint is everywhere. Lori, who worked as a car hop at her family's small town Dairy Queen, <laughs> probably ranks as Minnesota's most influential public affairs journalist over the last 40 years. She's been a reporter, an editor, weekly columnist, and author of eight books about Minnesota's historical heroes and heroines. In recent years, she has brought special attention to the disconnect between Metro Minnesota and Greater Minnesota, and she authored a powerful editorial page, a series of in early 2016, entitled, Better Together. Lori joined the Minneapolis Tribune as a summer replacement reporter in 1975, returned in 1976 as lead capital reporter for the Star Tribune and a newsroom assignment editor before joining the editorial staff in 1992. A native of South Dakota, Lori is a graduate of Cole College in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, and a member of that institution's board of trustees. Lori lives in St. Paul with her husband, and they have three grown children. Her optimism, her practical advocacy for Minnesota, for the character and who we are, has been brought so much benefit to our state, and we're so grateful. Please help me in welcoming Lori Sturdivant. Well, thank you, Kathy, and what a treat it is to be here. Thank you for inviting me, and thank you for caring about a topic that is near and dear to my heart. I think what we're about to talk about tonight is really important. As Kathy just mentioned, I'm sort of an amateur Minnesota historian, and my read of Minnesota's history is that our willingness to aggregate our resources, to come together as a state and pool our resources and then use them for the betterment of the whole state, has been really critical to Minnesota's success story. We pulled away in the late 20th century from other our, our peer states, other states in our region, in large part because we worked together as a state on education and transportation and social services and many other things that other states tried to do by themselves at the, at the local level rather than through the state, a, a strong state government. I'm afraid that the willingness to keep coming together in this way is at risk right now. And so your resources and your leadership and your vision of One Minnesota can make a big difference right now. Well, it, it's my happy task to interview Roger Moe, who will be the featured speaker tonight. And that's a treat for me, because one of the first legislators I interviewed in 1979 when I first came to the Capitol full time was Roger Moe. He was the head of the Senate Finance Committee then. This was before he was majority leader. He was only 35 years old, but he was already a Senate veteran. He had been elected for the first time in 1970. When he was elected, he was the, the second youngest state senator in Minnesota history. I quickly discovered that Roger was one of the most approachable and likable and competent and effective legislators, state senators, in the institution. Roger, we didn't know then that you would soon be the Senate Majority Leader or that your mentor and friend Nick Coleman would leave us way too soon. That was fate. But your staying power and your success through the 22 years that you headed the Senate DFL Majority Caucus, that wasn't fate or luck. That was authentic leadership. 
Did I ever tell you, Roger, that I thought that authentic leadership should have been your campaign slogan in 2002? <laughs> I should have told you that. It probably should. Have. It's a little, 15 years is a little too late to mention that, probably. But I consider some of the accomplishments of those 22 years. You worked first with a Republican governor to get this state out of chronic deficits and set the table for the next 20, year, 20 years of prosperity. And then you worked with an often unpredictable DFL governor, a colorful guy, who tur to turn his brainstorms into practical programs, things like the Job Skills Partnership that we, uh, is with us today to help lift the skills level of businesses throughout the state. You helped get the state of Minnesota through the farm crisis of the 1980s with smart initiatives like farmer lender mediation to continue to allow farmers to stay on their farms. You created a coordinated higher education system out of the disparate institutions that were scattered throughout Minnesota. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you tonight the father of the Minsky system. Uh, and pertinent to our conversation tonight, you secured the seed money that created Minnesota's six regional initiative foundations, still growing strong and represented here tonight, 30 years later. All the while, yeah, all right. <laughs> All the while, Roger kept his caucus, his DFL caucus together. There was seldom talk in those years about a visible rural-urban divide. You also kept the minority engaged so that the Senate was a place of bipartisan comity. That's comity with a T. And he won elections. I, I, I heard it told that there were only three DFL incumbents who lost election on Roger Moe's watch. And if that's true, that's remarkable. Roger Moe said it was a place of good sense and stability, and that's a place we miss and we wish we could bring back again. A few years ago, I, when I introduced this good man, I noted that a Minnesota politician can know he is, has secured a lasting place in the state's hearts and minds when he is universally referred to by his first name. Think of it. Everybody knows who I'm talking about when I mention Hubert, or Fritz, or Wendy, or Arnie. Well, there were two Rudys, I noted that night. But 15 years after he left office, there's still only one Roger. I give you Roger Moe. Thank you, Lori, for that uh, very kind introduction. Uh, I, of course, uh, I, on a bipartisan basis, when I have a nice introduction like that, I'm always harking back to two important individuals, Hubert Humphrey, who after an introduction like that said that uh, his father would have appreciated it and his mother would have believed it. <laughs> and uh, Dwight Eisenhower, after a nice introduction, said praise is like perfume. It's all right as long as you don't swallow it. So I, I won't do that. Uh, I, I, had a, I invited two people here tonight uh, and I don't see one of them. Is Bev here? No. Uh, uh, Bev Turner was the uh, Senate counsel back in uh, the, the uh, 30 years ago when we passed this economic development package that I'm going to talk about tonight. And I wanted, uh, I wanted her here. And she said she would be here, but she, wouldn't, she would not draft any more amendments or unofficial <laughs> endorsements. So I think she was afraid she would have to do that, because when I tell you the story about this bill, you'll know why. She probably got all scared of, the, of something happening. happening. Uh, the other, though, is Vic Moore. Vic, stand up so we can see you, because you're short. Uh, uh, Vic. Uh, Vic uh, and I have been together for almost 40 years. Uh, he was chief of staff and the, kind of the key person who helped uh, with the legislation uh, 30 years ago. And uh, so it's, uh, it's fun to, it's fun to uh, talk a little bit about the past. And uh, I, most importantly, though, I want to thank you for, for engaging this discussion about this rural-urban uh, divide. and. Uh, and to hopefully strategize, if you will, to see if there are some ways that we can, can heal the breach, if I might steal a, a, a phrase. Um, my charge tonight is to tell you uh, about a significant rural economic development package that passed uh, in 1987. Now, by saying that, I kind of have answered some of, some of the, the issue, right? It was 30 years ago. Uh, times were different than they are today. 
A lot of demographics are different, politics are different, a whole host of things. So to a certain degree, that tells you uh, part of why we were able to do it. Uh, this uh, particular package, this, uh, the Rural and Economic Development Act of 1987, which was, which was Senate File 1. And I want to talk a little bit about Senate File 1. I, I'll refer to it that way, all right? Um, and just so you know that it was 30 years ago, that's me. <laughs> See with dark hair? You know? so, um, the, the reason I, I want to mention Senate File 1 is because uh, if, you, if you'll notice when the legislative sessions start, uh, these in recent years, they will, the House File 1 or Senate File 1 will be kind of their marquee issue or the issue that they want to highlight. Well, that process started in 1987 with Senate File 1, and it's been going on ever since. And so that's one of the only marks I'll probably leave on the legislature, but uh, it's, it, I think it's a good uh, process to follow. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the conditions that led up to the creation of the legislation, the process we went through, and a little bit about what it included. I will kind of put that in the context of today and see if it's something like that could happen today. And then I will close by uh, seeing if uh, foundations might be interested in taking on a couple of challenges that I might uh, suggest. So with that, uh, let me start. Now, uh, when Thick uh, reminisces about this, he only goes back to about 1986, 85, 86. I go back to the summer of 1980. And uh, as uh, Lori indicated, the majority leader at the time, the, the, uh, Nick Coleman, who's the father of the mayor of St. Paul, uh, Nick uh, was uh, ill with leukemia. He was the majority leader of the Senate at the time. He had announced he wasn't going to run again. He was diagnosed with leukemia. And so he was not in a condition to run the campaign. And so he asked me to run the Senate campaign. So my responsibility was to kind of orchestrate 67 different Senate can uh, candidates around the state and to come up with a, a, a strategy. But we were on the ropes. Uh, Governor Cui, had a very good 79 and 80 legislative session. Uh, in 79, he was able to pass uh, a big tax proposal that he wanted, which was the indexing of the income tax. He, uh, 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 we got on the ballot, uh, he wanted on the ballot, the initiative and referendum, uh, but he had, he had a successful 79 and 80 session. At 80, uh, there was a budget shortfall, at least predicted, and, and they, they came out of that with a, with a strategy on the, on the budget that uh, looked very good at the time. And so we really didn't have much to go on. Well, all of a sudden, in August of 1980, the, the second quarter of 1980, the, the economic indicators were showing early, uh, early signs of a recession. And back then, when the governor uh, was given bad news like that, it was, it was monthly. And the law required the governor to immediately remedy that problem. And so he did what he had to do. He reduced the budget. Well, he reduced K-12 education, higher education, and local government aid. <clears throat> well, you can imagine, I was on the plane the next day all over the state, and we had our issues. And uh, the rest, of course, we had a successful election. Uh, and uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, we, um, the, the Senate majority and the House majority, unfortunately, we inherited a very difficult uh, budget problem because the recession kept getting worse and worse. During 81 and 82, we had five special sessions just on the budget. And here's what we did, all of them painful. We cut the budget, we raised taxes, and we shifted every payment we could possibly imagine or find. And we did that five different times. And so it was a very difficult time. And so in, in uh, the election then, uh, come about, Governor Cui uh, did the, one of the most courageous things, I think. He, he set the table, he basically allowed a tax increase to go into effect and help the next governor. He had announced he wasn't going to run again. And so he set the table for Governor Perpich, who then came back into office. 
So again, so the Democrats had control in 83 and 84, but again, the recession kept kind of dragging on now, particularly in rural areas of the state. And so in 84, the Democrats lost control of the House. So we weren't up in the Senate, thank goodness. And uh, so then we started in, in 85 and 86. Um, uh, we have, a, a, again, a, a good discussions back and forth. And in 86, uh, like I said, the economy hadn't it, it re improved it like it should have in the country. And so the 86 elections, again, the, the, Demo the Republicans lost the House and the Democrats picked up many seats. And so now we get into 1987. And the, Governor Perpich won re-election big. We had big majorities in the House and the Senate. The Senate had 47 Democrats out of 67. We had the largest state Senate in the nation. We had 47 out of 67. Now that's important, uh, not just because I was the leader at, and I really liked all those votes. It's important because we had districts all over the state. We had districts in northern Minnesota, western Minnesota, southern Minnesota, center Minnesota, all the different parts of the suburbs in the center city. In, a, in effect, the caucus was a kind of a, a statewide perspective. And in that caucus, believe it or not, were the most liberal members of the Senate, as you could expect, and the most conservative. And the most conservative. And out of that, of course, you're going to get a, a, a package just in the caucus. We were able to get a package that reflected pretty much what the state wanted. And so I, I mentioned that because I think that's important as we, as we reflect on how we were able to get some, certain things done. So anyway, in, in, uh, in, um, uh, 80, in that time frame, that basically now we had, we had kind of transitioned into a, a recession that was primarily a natural resource recession. Ag, mining, and forestry were all down. I don't know if this is true, Tony, but George Perpich told me that back in the late 70s, there were 13 to 14,000 steel workers on the range. 13 to 14,000. Today, there's 3,500 maybe producing more taconite than they did back then. In 1950, we had 180,000 farms. By 1984, we had 103. Today, we have about 73,000. Between 1981 and 1985, 39% drop in the average value per acre in the state. In 84 and 85, there was a 12% drop in land value, and the consumer price index was up 4%, so the net impact on farmers was 16% negative. Now, why is that important? Because farmers, they what they take to go to the farm lending agency is the value of their land. And that's, that's when it started to slip. And uh, farm after farm got into in, uh, financial difficulty. And so uh, all of that, of course, set the table then for the 87 session, which was to pass uh, a fairly comprehensive rural and economic development package. Now, let me, uh, before I go on to that, let me back up a little bit. It's uh, sometime during the session of 1986. And I'm reading in Lori's newspaper a little column. It's, it's uh, one column wide, four or five inches long. And I read that and I clipped it out. And not long after that, I called Russ Ewald. And I said, uh, Russ, uh, can we have lunch? He said, sure. So we met at uh, Leanne Chin's in the depot in downtown St. Paul. <laughs> and I took this little thing out of my pocket and I gave it to Russ and I said, uh, did you read this? And he, and he read it. And I, then I said, Russ, is that fair? And he said, no, that's not fair. And the story was, that out of $10 that, that foundations give, nine out of the 10 went into the urban areas. One dollar went to rural Minnesota. And he said, no, that's not fair. Later on that summer, 
he invited me to go to a national philanthropic conference in Detroit. And that night, he and uh, um, others from the Knight Foundation, I know Nancy Latimer was there, and, and, and uh, we went for dinner. And we went uh, across, uh, or I should say under the river, to uh, Windsor, Windsor, Canada. And we had dinner at a restaurant called the La Bastille. And uh, that's when he indicated that they were going to put significant money into these initiatives. And he's often referred to that dinner from then on as the most expensive dinner he ever had. So, <laughs> so um, we get ready to start the 1987 session. I had indicated to Governor Perpich at the time that I was going to carry his, his he had a, uh, a proposal called the Greater Minnesota Corporation. And uh, the Greater Minnesota Corporation was an idea that he had, he had witnessed uh, from uh, a couple of other ideas like this around the country, the Ben Franklin Technology Development Authority in Pennsylvania and the Battelle Science and Technology Institute in Ohio. And this was, this Greater Minnesota Corporation was to finance applied research and product development and was uh, enabled to take equity positions and to provide venture capital to start up businesses, in this case, rural businesses. And uh, what really caught the governor's eye, of course, was that the Patel Institute had bought a 60% interest in a small copying company. And that small copying company became Xerox. And he thought, we, we can do that. And so I indicated I would be uh, the author of his, of his proposal, the Greater Minnesota Corporation. And so we put that into uh, Senate File 1. And uh, in that proposal, I, I'll, I'll just walk through it. We had a number of articles. One was the creation of the Rural Development Board. Uh, this statewide uh, board was, was to oversee a, a rural rehab loan program and a newly created challenge grant program. Um, that uh, it had two, a couple of responsibilities, uh, develop a, a rural investment guide, which was to be a strategy to advise state agencies in higher education on rural uh, development uh, investment, and then to provide these challenge grants of a million dollars to the six newly established regions in the state. And how we managed to find this money, Vic found it actually. It was a, in a, uh, uh, there was a old uh, farmer uh, federal farmer home program that uh, a, a board had been using basically the interest off it and what we were able to do he was able to go and convince the uh, USDA I think it was to allow us to use these uh, resources in a different manner and we were able to then provide that match that that challenge with those with the McKnight money and thus create the uh, the regional foundations which have been so successful up to today. And so, um, while this uh, Rural Development Board, it, that no longer exists, and the Rural Investment Strategy never really accomplished what it in, was intended, these, in, these regional initiative funds, as I indicated, have been going strong. Now let me, I want to highlight this. The Rural Investment Strategy never accomplished what it intended. I'm going to get back to that a little later. Uh, secondly, the Greater Minnesota Corporation, I told you what that was all about, and, and uh, uh, unfortunately, great, a great idea, um, uh, significant resources uh, were devoted to it, but it never really took off the way it uh, was intended. Um, the, uh, one, of the, one of the parts of that bill was to create regional research institutes. Uh, one of those was the uh, uh, Jerry Schoenfeld. Tim was very instrumental in, in uh, pushing that effort and it was to create a, uh, the Ag Utilization and Research Institute. And at the time, a part of the problem with agriculture was, was overproduction. And, uh, and he felt the university, that's all the university focused on was overproduction. And uh, he wanted us to figure out strategies to de develop new uses for the agricultural products that we, that we are, uh, are so good at raising. And so uh, that is uh, one of the efforts, it's still going strong as well as the uh, uh, Iron Range Resource and Rehabilitation uh, effort on the, on the Northeast. Um, we created the Public Facilities Authority. 
at the time, and, and again, it was controversial because uh, the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency not only regulated water and wastewater treatment, but also funded it. And we felt it was important to separate those two. And we were able to get, again, Vic was able to get uh, a waiver from the federal EPA to, uh, to, to separate those two. And uh, 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 the uh, Public Facilities Authority is a, is a very, it's been going strong ever since and uh, deals with a lot of the water efforts in our state. Uh, we created uh, the Community Development Division at, at the time in, in what was called DTED, now it's DEED. That division still exists today. Uh, we uh, abolished some of the en Energy and Economic Development Authority and transferred those uh, various uh, functions to the Public Facilities Authority and as well as to the Ag and Economic Development Board was established. Uh, we had an urban revitalization program. Now you'd say, why was an urban revitalization program in this bill? Well, this bill was going to pass. <laughs> and, my colleagues, and my colleagues from the cities knew it was going to pass. And so um, I, I thought if they wanted to get on, that's great. That, that helps the broaden the appeal to the program. And so we uh, 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 have the urban revitalization program, which is still in effect. We had um, a uh, natural resources uh, division and it created a uh, minerals coordinating committee that was charged with developing a 10-year mineral diversification plan and appropriation for that. Um, and of course, no statewide economic development bill would be complete without uh, a, a provision for the Iron Range delegation. Am I right, Tony? That's right, that's right. So we had to make sure that we uh, uh, broadened the authority of the uh, 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 of the IRRRB and uh, provided some loan guarantees and interest buy downs and, and, and the like at some additional revenues. Uh, the Ag and Economic Development Board was created to provide low interest and no interest loans for Ag and Economic Development projects in the state. This program is still operating within the Department of, uh, uh, with Indeed. And uh, we expanded the job training and education programs. Uh, Lori mentioned the uh, um, Minnesota Job Skills Partnership. We, uh, we uh, broadened the scope of the Dis Dislocated Workers Program and the Job Skills Partnership Program to include farmers that were dislocated as a result of the crisis. And uh, uh, some of those programs are still in effect today. In effect, we put a lot of money into it. There was $95.5 million uh, endowment for the Greater Minnesota Corporation and another $37.5 million was appropriated for all of this. Um, it took uh, 17 different committee hearings, 10 unofficial engrossments uh, in order to get the bill passed. And again, as you can tell, as is the case in, I think, in most kind of uh, political situations, the times dictate what's going to happen. There were tough, uh, tough rural times and folks responded in the legislature. Um, so let me get to that part. Uh, kind of good news, bad news. I think the bad news is something like this couldn't pass today. Um, it's, the times aren't right. Uh, uh, the rural economy, I, albeit I think we would probably argue one of the biggest problems is some of the wage differentials, but by and large, uh, different sectors of the rural economy is not, not too bad. And I think the sign I see most often is help wanted. Um, so, but it has more to do with wages. Um, the uh, demographics are different, a uh, whole host of things that probably would prevent us from having something like this pass today. But the good news is, I think that um, programs like this, maybe not to this degree, and it doesn't necessarily indicate that there would not be any involvement from the legislature or Congress or other, uh, other uh, non-government sources, uh, but I believe that most programs that are going to be successful in the future are going to be organic, where they're going to come out of a community or an organization. And so that kind of gets me to where you all are at and how foundations can help. And I want to suggest three different things that I think, uh, if, if for no, not, nothing else, you can at least have something to talk about at your table and say, the, <laughs> those are really dumb ideas or something. But. Um, 
You know this divide we have in, in Minnesota? Um, you know, a lot of it is caused by the political rhetoric. Really. It's, it's, if you're in the country, what do you run against? You run against the cities. And that has been so ongoing now for way too long that I think it's contributed to this divide. And the reality is, the reality is that Minnesota has a Robin Hood fiscal policy. It really does. We collect money from the income, sales, and corporate taxes, and we put it into a fund, and the legislature devises different formulas for the education part and the health care part and the local government aid part and that sort of thing. Well, where do you think the income and sales and corporate taxes come from? Primarily in the large urban areas. And where does the money go? It goes to fund my schools, where I come from, and help my nursing homes. And so I wish that an urban or urban and rural or a couple of rural foundations would do a serious study on where does the money come from, where does the money go? Because I think that some of this rhetoric, at least somebody would have the power then to say, wait a minute, wait a minute, we're kind of in this together. And uh, uh, I think we'll find out some interesting things. So anyway, that's something to think about. Um, now I have to point out, I'm a trustee on the Minnesota State College and University Board, okay? Uh, so, um, if you think I'm uh, kind of uh, panhandling for them, you're right. <laughs> um, first of all, I, I have been give, given permission on behalf of the board to thank you, to thank all of the foundations that have been generous to the various campuses across the state, so thank you very much for that. Uh, I'm going to challenge you to take a look at some other things. This is a great system. It's the fourth largest higher education system in the country. Uh, 30 different colleges, seven universities, 54 different campuses. I said this before I became a trustee, and I'll repeat it tonight. The best economic development program in this state is that higher ed system. And it's all over the rural parts of the state. So it's the best rural development program we have in the state, and it's already in place. It needs your help to realize its full potential. It needs your help. And so, I just, uh, I think, uh, <coughs> excuse me, things are happening so fast. Change, you know, what, what used to happen in a couple of years now is taking a couple of months. Uh, my friend Jim Benson, who is, uh, who is a futurist up in Bemidji, he tells me there's 25,000 new things every day in the world. Now, I don't know how Jim knows this, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, there's just a lot of things going on. And I want to uh, highlight here, if I might, from this is a June Time magazine. And this is about a little campus. The, the story says the case for community college, but it's really, it's a two-year technical institute. It's in a little town, uh, Water, Watertown, South Dakota, well, it's not all that little, but uh, the Lake Area Technical Institute. And the Lake Area Technical Institute, it, this story is all about that, and they go on to say that they have uh, uh, a student body of 2,500, it's had 14 consecutive years of enrollment growth. You know what the problem we face in the M State system? Is enrollment decline, serious decline. Officials originally project, project, projected that the Lakes Area Technical Institute would reach its current size in 2040.
what has been so successful for them is this. The evolving curriculum is designed with input from more than 300 regional businesses and starting salaries for their alumni average 27% more than those of other new hires in the region. You know, foundations are probably one of the last institutions left that are highly regarded. They're perceived as being neutral and credible. I challenge you to be the conveners for these, these regions and these campuses. Because I think in some areas of the state they do this and they probably do a pretty good job. But we're going to have to do more. I mean, if, if in fact you can have a, a small rural technical institute in South Dakota have enrollment growth, I think if you can do it there, you can do it anywhere. But you have to have that the curriculum designed to meet the needs of that region. And so I'm asking you to seriously think at, of how you can strategize and help the sustainability of these campuses. And, I, and, I, and I, just so you know, some of our campuses in this system are under great stress, great stress. And we have to be creative. I was telling Tony, I just heard the other day that the Department of Interior, U.S. Department of Interior, over the next five years, they have 45,000 people eligible to retire. Well, they've got to be replaced. <laughs> and what better place than educating them in northern Minnesota, where we have a lot of public lands and Indian reservations, which the Department of Interior deals with. So there are some things that I think we can be looking at. So I, I hope you seriously look at how you can help the M-State system realize its full potential in, in rural development. Finally, let me say this. If we were to go outside on the street out here, I guess it's out there, uh, and we were to ask 100 people what foundations do, I would guess that you know, 98, 99 of them would say, I like they give away money. Uh, I'd like you to think about what you do in a little bit different way. I want you to think about it this way, that you're in the business of giving hope. You can say you're kind of in the business of funding hope. Now think about it. Somebody or a group of people or a community or an organization, they had hope. They had hope. And that hope begot a vision, and that vision begot a plan, and they brought that plan to you. And you evaluate it, and you say, hey, that makes sense. We're going to put a little money into this. In other words, you're funding hope. I think what you need to do in some parts of rural Minnesota, probably won't work all over, but I think you have to use some of your resources to inspire hope. And the reason it probably won't work all over is because our bishop was at our church on Sunday, and he had a great line. And so I can use it tonight in the same context. He said, uh, <clears throat> he said, you know what the last seven words are of a dying church? And you could say the same thing about a dying community. The last seven words of a dying church. We never done that way before. And I'm, I hope I got seven there. We've never done it that way before. It's the last seven words of a dying church. Well, it's probably the last seven words of a dying community. But there are communities that I think that you can use your resources to help develop the capacity that, that, that inspiration that can inspire some hope. And, and uh, uh, so I'm simply asking you to kind of go one step back upstream to help inspire hope in these communities for, for them to address some of their own problems. With that, I hope I've left you some ideas to think about and talk about. Thank you so much.